So I am Diego Suero. I am an embedded um, uh, Linux platform engineer at Sepura in Cambridge, UK. And I am the CEO of Embarcados, which means Embedded, a website with articles about embedded systems development in Portuguese. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm sorry about my terrible English, but I hope you be able to understand what I am trying to pass to you. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be our agenda. First, we are going to talk about um, these uh, heterogeneous multiprocessors in real-time applications. Uh, then we will introduce to a Open AMP, then to RPMS RPMSG. Then we are going to talk about a variation of this another implementation that is the RPMSG Lite. Then we will see how we enable the RP message on Linux. H how do we enable the RP message light on Zephyr? How is the communication set up between the Linux and Zephyr? Uh, with some luck, a demo. Uh, it's working here. Let's see if when I we will actually show you if this is going to work and the future work about this. Uh, the organizer shrunk the, the presentation from 15 minutes to 40 minutes. Let's see if I will be able to make it in 40 minutes. If not, uh, if I have to go through quickly to the slides or I can't show you the demo, I will be more than happy to show you offline or address any questions after the presentation, okay? So, uh, before we start, uh, just a few words. Um, this work I've made with um, the hardware reference platform is an IMX7 processor from NXP. Uh, the full OpenAMP implementation was not used and it's not being totally covered here. And you will understand the reasons during this talk. Uh, the, um, the full AMP on Zephyr is supported on mainline, but mostly the demo application for these is for an um, NXP processor with a Cortex M0 and a Cortex M4. And the Zephyr is run, there is a, an, an instance of Zephyr for each core on this, uh, uh, for the open AMP. And of course, the work is open source, it's not mainlined yet for both the Linux kernel and uh, the Zephyr. So let's talk about real-time applications in HMPs, as known as hybrid multiprocessing or asymmetric multiprocessing. You choose the flavor that you most like, okay? Uh, the idea is different CPU architectures and combinations can be found in the same SOC like application cores with Cortex-A something, DSPs, FPGAs, low power and real-time uh, performance cores like a Cortex-M4, or graphics acceleration, video, encoding, decoding, and these kind of things. Some applications may have requirements like real-time performance, performance optimization, low power consumption, fast booting, um, system integrity and security, uh, usage of certified uh, software solutions, or even reuse uh, a legacy software. Uh, in the Linux kernel with the preempty RT patches, uh, can meet some of these requirements, but turning, customizing, debugging, maintaining, updating is costly in terms of knowledge time and money. Uh, with uh, the hybrid multiprocessing, you can have uh, complete isolation and partitioning of the software domains. You can have um, sensors and actuators hub, and even a reduction of the BOM costs. But some challenges will come up. Uh, Interprocessor synchronization and communication, efficient power management, shared resources isolation and protection, cache coherency management, so like uh, the remote processor can 
uh, be accessing an outdated data. And the SOC vendors are investing a lot in these new hybrid architectures for different um, marketing verticals. Uh, let's take a look um, how a typical hybrid multiprocessing looks like in a top-level view. So, uh, on the left side here, we have our application core, Cortex-A something, with its dedicated apps, peripherals, and memories. And on the right side, our real-time core, uh, with, again, with its dedicated uh, uh, real-time applications, peripherals, and memory. And we will have this shared resources like peripherals and memory uh, to be able to exchange data between these two cores. Uh, here in the left diagram, this one, uh, we can see the differences between uh, SMP, synchronous multiprocessing, and, and uh, asynchronous multiprocessing here. So uh, in here we find mostly one instance of uh, the operating system running on the top of the same core architectures. And on a heterogeneous uh, arrangement, you, you have a different operating system running on a different core architecture. Uh, on the right side, uh, it's shown the, difference, the, the different cores in a shared bus topology, where you have your different cores in here, a bus fabric that it's shared between these cores, and they can eventually share the slave device. These slave devices will eventually generate interrupts that is again shared, can be shared between those cores as well, okay? Uh, so, uh, let's see a real life um, example here for the IMX7 uh, solo processor. We have uh, our main CPU here, a Cortex-A7, it, with its own features, caches, and uh, in here we have the secondary CPU that is a Cortex M4 with its own caches and features. Uh, in this case, for the IMX processors, uh, the NXP has uh, this hardware unit that uh, the first one is the resource domain controller. That is, it, it will actually uh, manage the access to the uh, to the bus, to the bus fabric of the SOC, and the cores to, to, to be able to access these uh, resources, these common resources. Um, then we have the messaging unit uh, that is, the, um, is a set of mailbox registers that we will enable you to share data between those cores or even generate interrupts to notify each core. And then you have uh, this semaphore that is uh, basically a harder enforced um, semaphore. So uh, we saw how um, hybrid multiprocessing looks like. Let's talk about now the frameworks and protocols options that we have to available to communicate uh, between these uh, asynchronous cores. So the OpenAMP uh, is a standard managed by the multi-core association, and it is implemented in both Linux kernel and Zephyr mainline. Uh, it is composed by the remote proc, which stands for remote processor, which is a framework for life cycle operations that allows the master to control and manage the remote processors. So operations like power on, power off, reset, uh, firmware loading are implemented in this framework. Then you have a messaging framework that is the RPMSG, the Remote Processor Messaging, that provides the interprocessor communication 
by using the VIRTIO component for shared memory management when you want to send or receive the data from to the master and remote core, okay? It's all, it's all about shared memory, okay? You have uh, proxy operations as well, where user space apps running on the master side have transparent access to the remote using file system calls like open, close, read, write. So it's very simple in this, it's very transparent in this matter. Uh, and proposed by ST and is still in discussion, the resource manager, that is the uh, RPROC SRM, that um, is a management for the shared system resources like memory, reset, clocks, and shared peripherals resources between the master and the remote without conflicting to each other. This is still in discussion. There is no uh, implementation that we can test or something like that. It depends on the LibMetal as an operating system environment abstraction layer and a hardware abstraction layer as well. And there is a working in progress uh, to decouple the, R, uh, the remote proc from the RP MSG to be used uh, independently. Uh, and because of this, uh, it will not be used on our demo here. And you will understand the, the dependency between them in this slide. Uh, we are gonna take a very quick look on this diagram uh, because the idea is not to go into detail, but uh, roughly, after the master side here uh, receives the remote firmware image, it will decode it to find a resource table that is in the header of this firmware. This resource table basically contains the information about the communication channels supported by the remote. With this information then, the master will create the VIRTIO device to communicate with the remote. Then it will effectively uh, boot the remote processor. Here, we will start the remote processor, right? And uh, the remote processor, when it initializes, it, it will get this uh, resource table information and create its own VIRTIO device. And then advertise the remote channels to the master and now they are good to go to communicate. Uh, so, and here in the middle, we, uh, it is shown how you generate this resource table and put in the remote firmware. There is a, a restriction today, that is for the IMX7 devices, the remote proc um, mainline driver, does not implement the VTIO device creation using the data from the firmware, the resource table. And instead of this, uh, NXP implemented in their repository uh, all these VTIO initialization, the device, create, uh, device creation, rings, queues, uh, inside the RP message drive by using the data from the device tree. So, uh, this data will be set in the device, t, device tree and the RP message driver will consume this information instead of the remote proc getting the resource table from the firmware and then create it, okay? Uh, so, now let's talk about the RP message. Uh, it's very simple, okay? Uh, following the OZ standard, we have the physical layer here, uh, where uh, we find the shared memory and the intercore uh, interrupt is the mailbox. Then we have the media access control layer, which is basically implementing the VTIO and the VT, VTIO queues. And then the transport layer, that is the RP message implementation for the messaging transactions. Uh, for the physical layer, so here in the left diagram, we have uh, 
the shared memory that is used to exchange the messages and interrupt lines to notify each processor. On the right side for the NXP, we will use the message unit to be able not to exchange the data, but it's not, it's, the message unit is not the shared memory. So we use the interrupts, control registers in the message unit to notify each processor, and we use one uh, register to notify the other processor if we want to receive a data or send a data but the data itself is not in this unit, okay? Uh, the media access layer, the VRTIO. Uh, we will not have time to cover the VRTIO component in details, but as a top level introduction, it basically is used to transfer the data in a shared memory region using a um, single writer, single reader, circular buffer. And each side uh, transmission or reception has two, two ring buffers, um, used and available ring buffer. Uh, the ring buffers roughly contain the address of the shared memory location where the RP message data is, okay? And in the OpenAMP wiki, there are details on how the RP message framework uses the VRTIO and all the data structures, okay? Uh, there are these two presentations that gives more detail about the VRTIO itself. And finally, the transport layer, we find the RP message protocol implementation. Uh, the message is, again, is stored in, 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 in a shared memory area and the address is on the VRTIO virtual rings. And it's very simple. You have 32 bits for a source local address, then a 32 bit for the destination address, reserved area, then you put the length of the payload of the data, and some flags. This is it. In a more higher level view for the RP message, we have here our master and, for example, a remote. In each side, you have an endpoint, what we call endpoint, with a local address, right? And when a communication channel uh, uh, is announced, is created, this endpoint will create a logical link. So in, a, in the same shared memory, you can have different channels between different endpoints, okay? So here is an example of uh, uh, when the master wants to send an information, it puts uh, the data, of course, its local address and the destination address. Upon receiving, the remote side will decode this. Oh, okay, so this message is for me. Let, it's from the, this address. So yeah, this is the channel. And then we'll carry on on your application. Now, let's take a look in the um, RP message light. So uh, it's altered and maintained by Marek Novak. Uh, it's an implementation, it's a, it's a simplification of the extensive API implemented by, uh, by the OpenAMP. It has a smaller, smaller footprint when compared to the OpenAMP implementation. Uh, you can see more details about this in the GitHub page has an option to use an static API, so no malocs, and uh, to reduce the code size. Uh, and this can be very beneficial for a small system. And it's totally decoupled from the remote proc. There is no remote proc 
uh, dependency here. It has two subcomponents. One is the queue, that is a blocking receiving API, which is commonly found in the RTOS environments and requires an implementation in the environment adaptation layer. The other component is the name service, which allows the communicating nodes to send announcements about the channels, like creation and deletion of these channels. Um, this name service announcement is implemented in the Linux kernel side, and it's mandatory for the remote to send this announcement in order to the Linux kernel, uh, create the channel and be able to communicate with the remote side. The architecture, so uh, in this diagram, uh, you can see that this, uh, how the source code is structured. Uh, you basically have here your, your application source code, then you have the API layer that is effectively implementing the API, the name service, the queues, and the core of the RP MSG. Then the engine that is uh, implementing the virtual EIO, virtual queue, and then the porting layer, which is splitted in the environment porting layer, so like FreeRTOS, Bermato, uh, or Zephyr, and the platform uh, that is um, an abstraction layer for the underlying hardware that you find on your system. The RP MSG Lite is fully compatible with what is implemented in the Linux kernel side or with the RP message uh, standard. This is uh, a diagram that we can see the interaction between these components and some examples of function calls that you will find between these uh, components. And the source code is very simple and it's very easy to follow, okay? So let's see how do we enable the RP message on Linux. In this case, we are following the platform that we are using, that is the NXP IMX7, and using the, IN, the, the NXP Linux kernel source code. So this is not in the main line, okay? And this is uh, regarding the 4.9 version. Uh, when you set the config SOC IMX7, it will automatically select all these RP message related configs and the MU driver, okay? And here you can see the source code location for these drivers and it will select a, as a module uh, these IMX RP message TTY that is effectively is a driver that will expose the RP message channel to the user space as a TTY device. So from the user space, it will look, the, the remote will look like a ordinary serial port. So no secrets from the, uh, UR, from the user space side. The device tree, so in this case for the IMX7 solo, in the DTSI, we needed to add the message unit node, uh, the register uh, range, the register address, all the interrupts, the clocks that it's using, and the RP message node with the compatible string. For the hardware, for the board, like in this case the WARP7, uh, which uses the IMX7 solo processor, we, we will set on the RP message node the memory, uh, the shared memory region, okay? And we need to instruct the kernel that this, that this is a reserved area. You are not gonna map this area, okay? We, we enable the UR, we, sorry, we disable the UR2 interface because in this demo, uh, I am using the UART2 for the M4 side as a normal console, uh, serial console, okay? 
So let's see how do we enable this RP message light on Zephyr. So the IMX MU driver is still in review in Zephyr. So then I created a fork from this PR and added support for the IMX7 specifically and the WARP7 board. Uh, the NXP guys tried to add the RP message light on Zephyr, but the technical steering committee of Zephyr chose to only include the OpenAMP implementation as the default IPC mechanism. But it's still, it's very easy to have uh, the RP message light compiled alongside with uh, Zephyr. Uh, so, because of this, I created a fork from the RP message light to support the Zephyr, that uh, environment uh, layer, and uh, support the IMX7 platform as well by using the MU driver. Uh, the MU driver on Zephyr uh, will um, implement the Zephyr IPM, that is Interprocessor inter inter Mailbox API, that is defined in this header. And um, here you find the, the source, all the source code location related to the MU driver. And uh, we configure and we use the, M the IPM driver aligned with the Linux side where the RP message will use four bytes with the register index one for the messaging direction control in using the bit 16. So I think if it's zero, it's receiving. If it's one, it's transmitting. The porting layers. Uh, in the RP message light, uh, the Zephyr porting layer is defined in this header, okay? And it's implemented in this source code file. And it provides general OS functionalities like memory handling, allocation, deallocation, mutexes operations. And for the platform side, or the IMX7, it will implement the, the API defined in this header and it's implemented in this uh, source code that it's basically uh, uh, exposing the, uh, or abstracting how to use the IPM driver on Zephyr. To build it, uh, we need to, to, to select the subsystem, the IPM subsystem inside the Zephyr that is controlled with the config IPM, and select our lower level driver implementation of the IPM. In this case, it's gonna be the IPM IMX. To build the IP, the, the RP message light itself, we control by using this configuration, and it is compiled alongside with the application using the normal kconfig, uh, uh, the uh, P prjconf, and the uh, CMake lists file. Uh, it's uh, very like uh, when you uh, compile a normal Zephyr application. And this is a list of all the source code uh, um, related to this uh, remote echo sample app. We are gonna see in details a little bit more about this app. So now let's see uh, the communication setup between Linux and Zephyr. <coughs> Some water. So in a top level view, in the left side, we have our master domain, the Linux, running on the A7. And on the right side, the remote domain running Zephyr on the M4. For our demo on the power up, the U-boot on the master side is responsible for loading both the Linux kernel and the Zephyr on the M4 side and start the images, boot the images. When the Zephyr boots, it creates the virtual the virtu queues and waits for the master to signal that the link is up. In parallel, the kernel boots, 
right? And then the RP message driver creates the virtual queue endpoints and then notifies the remote processor that the link is up. The remotes, and then after notifying, it will wait for the name service announcement. On the remote side, by receiving this link, that the link is up, it will create the endpoint and send the name service announcement. After that, both sides are good to go to send and receive messages. Let's see what do we have for our demo. Uh, simplistically, so I have here is the Warp 7 board. It's a very small board. Uh, so, the, again, the A7, the master domain with the Linux, we are connected to the UART1 of this system, and the remote side running Zephyr in the M4 core, we have the UART2 connected. Between those two cores, the RP message, by using the MU um, and the shared memory for exchanging the data. All the source code, how to compile, generate the Linux distro, and Zephyr image, and it's all documented here, and you can have access later. Uh, let's take a brief look into the remote app. The code is stripped because to, to fit in the screen. So uh, we set our uh, local endpoint address, and in here we have a set of defines that needs to be aligned with the Linux side, like the shared memory address, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the max size of the RP message, um, uh, the max size of the RP message messages, and the, the string with the, 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 the channel announce, okay? The name service announce. Then, this is our task. We basically declare the variables for the uh, RP message instance, the queue, the endpoint. In this case, we are using uh, name service so we can have a handle. Uh, when it receives some name service, it, it, can, it, can, it can cause a callback and you can do a process that you want. Here is the initialization process. So we call the RP message light remote init with the shared memory address, the link ID, and then it will return a pointer to the RP message instance. Then we are gonna wait for the link. And as soon as the master side notifies, we create our queue and with, regarding that instance, and then with the queue and the instance, we then create the endpoint, the local endpoint with that address. We send, uh, now we are good to go, to send the name service announce, and here we are inside a while true, good to go to receive and send the data. In this case, we are using the receive block API, as soon as uh, a data arrives, we, we will format that data by prepending an echo string and send it back to the remote. Okay, so we can see here it, uh, it, it, it will fill with the remote address and then we do whatever what we want and then we send back to the remote address. Yeah, so let me show, right? Demo, now it's time. Okay, so, in this side we have uh, the A7 uh, UART. Can you, can you see, the, is it good, the, the size? And on this side, we have the UART from the M4 running Zephyr. So here we stop it on U-boot. So if I issue a reset, I'm gonna reset the system. 
cross finger. Yeah. So we can see that Zephyr booted, is waiting for the master, and then when the, the, RP, the RP message driver came up, it notified, then the Zephyr sent the name service announce back, and on, the, on this RP message driver, in the initialization, after receiving the, the name service announce, it will send a hello world string, okay? Um, So here, oops. Okay. So uh, if we look into the D mask, so we can see that I think it's, uh, when the RP message driver is coming up, and it says that the, the, the MEU is ready for exchanging data to send or and notifying data to the other core. Then it will say that the RP message host is online, it registered the, the, the driver, and then when it receives the, the, the channel announce, it created this channel, and then it notifies the TTY driver that the channel is there, and the TTY driver is ready to go. So if I, for example, do a echo here, then we can see here that it received seven bytes, ELCE, and then it send echo with the string back. If we use the microcon, So, oops, let's see here. Oh, it's not showing this side no, anymore. So, oh, here, okay. So, whenever I type here, I don't know why it's not updating. Yeah, so if I keep typing here, so I can, for each character, is sending and then receiving it back, okay? <sighs> Almost finishing, so let's continue. So this is, the demo is very simple. It's just a proof of concept that we can have Zephyr and Linux exchanging data. Uh, so the future work. So uh, what we need to be upstream and in the upstream, so the remote proc driver, the mainline driver, dealing with the RP message, the VirtIO creation for the RP message usage, the MU driver, and the RP message drivers. We have some patchworks to deal with this. Uh, on the open AMP, hopefully having this decoupling between the remote proc and the RP message. Uh, on the Zephyr, actually having the IMX MU driver uh, merge it, and maybe having the RP message light as an um, alternative. And I want to conduct some uh, latency measurement tests by varying the memory type, because on this IMX7 you can use external memory, the DDR, or internal memories. It has a set of internal memories that's supposed to be fast much faster than the external memory, using static and dynamic memory allocation, copy, no copy mechanism, um, message buffer size, so change the message buffer size and even the number of buffers. So here the references, and yeah, this is it. Any questions? I have a microphone here. If, uh... Thank you. So uh, on the uh, AMX uh, 
X, X7, the architecture does that the Linux processor is the master, but maybe on other architecture, it will be the opposite. Uh, maybe the M4 is the master. So uh, is it possible to do that Zephyr uh, protects the memory of Linux and so on? Yes, it is. Uh, but there is a... Um, with the RP mess, uh, okay. F from the software perspective, is, it is possible to have the Zephyr as, as the master controlling what happens with the A7. But we have a, a constraint in the hardware for the IMX processor in this uh, isometric, uh, asymmetric arrangement. That is, the A7 is the primary core. It, it is the core that you effectually uh, start the M4 core. You can't, uh, you can't boot first on the M4 and then boot on the A7. It's a harder constraint. Uh, actually, that's a good question because I don't know on the Linux uh, implementation if it is possible the Linux to be a remote. I don't think so. I think that the Linux is only master. I can be wrong, I don't know if someone here has this information, but I think that, uh, but from your application perspective, you can implement saying that, okay, no, my, the M4 is effectively controlling things in the A7, so you can do this from your application. Yeah. Uh, just a short note that you really should have a look at the mainline kernel because a colleague of mine recently mainlined several patches uh, related to RP message there. Okay. And I, I don't know about the exact state, but you should have a closer look. Uh, yeah, I looked at uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> so in two weeks, a lot of things can change, right? Uh, you mentioned that in your demo, uh, you bought uh, load uh, the Zephyr to Cortex M4. Does it mean that it was loaded to RAM memory, or, the, or, or this is just just called to to flash memory? Uh, in this case, the Zephyr is being loaded in a TCM memory that is an on-chip memory of uh, 32k, so it's an on-chip memory. Mm -hmm. I think this application, this demo has uh, 15K of flash and, or 21K of flash and 15K of RAM. It's a very small application. Any more questions? No? Okay, so this is it. Thank you very much.